<laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Um, yeah, so my name is Jonathan Ullman, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here at Patrick Bifford Library. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to everybody online who's joining us as well. This is kind of like a little weird. I feel like I'm in two places at once, but um, I, I did unmute. So yeah, I guess uh, folks that are at home listening, just check us on my volume. If you can hear me okay, let us know in the chat. And likewise for all of you, if, if you guys can hear me, great. Um, if not, just let me know. I'll try to speak a little louder. Um, yeah, so I am here doing another stargazing event virtually this time. So um, that's because as Crystal mentioned, I work at the American Museum of Natural History um, where I am fortunate I get to use the Hayden Planetarium to teach middle and high school students um, about astronomy, um, all about you know, the stars and planets and everything in the universe uh, that we can show them. Um, a little bit more about myself. I grew up here in Medford. Um, so I went to Patrick Medford High School and then I went to Stony Brook University where I studied physics and astronomy. Um, and then I got into teaching science as an affiliate for Brookhaven National Lab before I moved into the city. Um, so yeah, my presentation is gonna make use of the software that we use in the planetarium called Open Space. Um, it is free. Uh, so if you are interested or a young one that you're with is interested, um, you can go to openspaceproject.com to download it. Um, it does take like a pretty hefty computer to be able to run it. Um, and it is still in beta. So it's not like the most user-friendly software, um, but it is available um, and it's completely open source. So uh, if you know like a computer nerd that like me that likes to get under the hood and like mess around with stuff, um, it's all free and available to do that. So to try to ensure as smooth a program as possible, I pre-recorded uh, some of the video segments that you're gonna see of me flying around in open space today. Um, and I did that so that A, we don't get lost in the universe. Um, we don't take a wrong right turn. And B, so that I could also inject some um, real video footage and NASA animations to help kind of spice up what we'll be talking about today. Um, with all that said, at the very end of the talk, if there's some time, I will do some live piloting so I can take suggestions of anywhere that you guys all want to visit and we'll, we'll, we will get lost. <laughs> all right, cool. Let me kill the lights. And let's start by taking a look at what it would be like to blast off into space uh, from the library's location here in Patchogue, all right? So we can do the countdown in five, four, three, two, one, lift off. And there we go. We see Main Street and Patchogue Lake. And yeah, well, it kind of starts off looking like Google Maps. So not too unfamiliar, but we get to zoom way farther away than what we can do in, in Google Maps. So there's Fire Island and now most of Long Island and the city. And we'll just keep zooming and zooming and zooming. And this software is pretty unique. It uses real NASA data in order to visualize all the things that we're gonna see. So in order to build a digital three-dimensional atlas, um, you have to start by taking some measurements of known celestial objects. Uh, with some tools. Uh, and so you kind of try to map out all the things that you can see and then even some of the things that you can't see, right? So to do this, astronomers use a special tool known as a telescope. Now, there we go. And today, what I wanted to do was update you on the world's most powerful telescope that NASA and its partners have just most recently built and launched into space. Uh, it's called the James Webb Space Telescope. So the telescope has been a long time coming. Um, it was actually conceived as the follow-up to the Hubble Space Telescope way back in the 1990s, uh, and then was seriously started to be planned to put together in the mid 2000s. And we can see here that the telescope is big, right? It is um, about 21 feet in diameter across its main mirror here, its primary mirror. 
And that's great, right? Big telescope means we have a lot of light collecting power. Uh, so we can look at things that are really faint and far away. But it's a double-edged sword because big telescope is tough to launch into space, right? So NASA engineers uh, had to construct this telescope to be able to fold. So we saw uh, part of the primary mirrors there, those hexagon, uh, gold hexagon shapes can flat back. Uh, and that way they can fit it inside of the rocket that they eventually lift off into space. But that pose, it, it solves one problem, but then it sort of creates a new one, right? Because now all of a sudden you've got this folded telescope that you launch into space and it needs to be able to unfold itself, right? There's no humans that are going on the ride with it. It's just gotta be able to do it automatically. So that became a new design challenge for the NASA team and something that had never been done before uh, James Webb. Also, I wanna point out really quick, um, all the folks that work at NASA that we see kind of zooming around in this time-lapse video, they're all dressed a little bit funny, right? They're wearing this kind of all white plastic jumpsuit. And that's because when you're working on a sensitive object like the James Webb Space Telescope, um, you need to work in what's called a clean room environment, right? You can have no dust or little pieces of hair flying around and, and getting caught on the telescope because that can totally disrupt all of the sensitive instruments. Um, you don't even want to get a little smudge on that mirror because it's not going to be able to work properly uh, otherwise. All right. So once the telescope was safely stored in the Ariane 5 rocket that would eventually bring it up into space, a launch date was set. And after a few delays due to technical setbacks and some unfavorable weather, the James Webb Space Telescope launched from French Guiana on December 25th, 2021 at 7.20 in the morning. And being that the telescope cost roughly $10 billion to make, the scientists were a little bit on edge <laughs> as this was launching. Um, they were very anxious anticipating this launch. But thankfully, everything went smoothly. So what we're seeing right now is real footage of Webb's separation from the rocket. And this took place about half an hour after the launch. And I think this footage is just extremely beautiful. And it kind of reminds me like, you know, if you guys like Star Wars out there, this is like Star Wars times a million, right? Because it's actually real. <laughs> So um, this is just, yeah, it's beautiful to see Earth and to see some man-made structure that we, you know, put out into space. In just a second, we're also going to see the first phase of the telescope's nominal deployment sequence. And that's just a really fancy way of saying how it starts to unfold by itself. So stretching out from the bottom, um, we see the deployment of the solar array. And this is like the powerhouse of the telescope. So um, it's collecting sunlight, converting that into electric electricity so that uh, James Webb will be able to have power for its scientific instruments and communication to and from earth and its propulsion systems. Uh, so yeah, so basically it just kind of unleashed a 20 foot solar panel for itself. Uh, but the solar array is just the first of 40 deployable structures that had to operate properly. So let's take a look at some of the other ones. So we saw the solar array that happened about a half hour after launch. And then at about two hours past launch, we see the high gain antenna is deployed. Uh, this gives James Webb the ability to send and receive commands from earth. Three days after launch, we see the sun shield pallet deploy. This is gonna start to give the telescope its final shape. Four days after launch, we see the tower assembly uh, extends. This creates a little bit of distance so that the instruments um, can stay cool from, uh, from the rest of the telescope. At five days past launch, we see the momentum flap deploys. Um, that's gonna keep the telescope steady uh, as it's in space. Six days, we start to see now the flaps 
of the sun shield are extending out from the midsection. And then seven days after launch, the sun shield tightens. And then 10 days after launch, we get the secondary mirror uh, apparatus coming down over the front. That's gonna be the mirror that actually reflects the light off of the primary mirror. So the big kind of honeycomb that we see here, uh, and then back into the center where the instruments are. And then finally, 12 and 13 days, we see the primary mirror flaps come back out after they were originally folded. All right. So as we just saw, the sun shield plays a pretty big role in this puzzle that is the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's crucial that the sun shield works properly in order for the telescope to operate properly. Why does it need a sun shield? So it's because the telescope actually traveled a million miles away from us uh, at Earth. And it's going to a spot known as L2 or the Lagrange point two. And on its journey, Webb needs to make sure all of the instruments stay very, very, very cold, right? We don't want heat uh, to be, you know, causing any sort of uh, remnant optics that we, that we don't want to see, right? So the sun shield is always going to be pointed towards the sun to cast a shadow on the rest of the telescope. And Webb is sort of floating towards this Lagrange point too. Um, we kind of gave it just enough juice with the rocket so that it would be able to just sort of gently coast to that final destination. And this point is a point in space where gravity, right? The gravitational pull from the sun and the earth is exactly equal to the centripetal force that the telescope is experience, uh, experiencing in its orbit. So James Webb doesn't actually orbit the Earth. It orbits the sun, just like the Earth does. And the two of them sort of go around in tandem in a longer orbit. The reason we did that is uh, so that we could kind of keep James Webb in the same relative spot compared to Earth so that we can always constantly be able to send communication to it, right? We don't have to sort of find it on different sides of the planet. It's always sort of where it is. And you'll notice too, like the telescope does this kind of loop-de-loop -loop as it goes around L2. And we did that in order to keep James Webb out of the shadow of the Earth and the moon. Uh, when uh, devices that rely on solar power are in shadow, they don't operate at 100%. Um, and so Hubble, for example, goes into Earth's shadow like every 90 minutes. And so we don't really get to use it as much as we would like to. Uh, with James Webb, we'll be able to operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All right, so how well does the sun shield work? Works pretty good actually. So the hot side of the telescope where the sun shield is blocking the sunlight uh, can reach up to 185 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty close to boiling water. And then on the other side, the cold side, the temperatures drop to minus 388 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a huge, huge difference. Um, but that does kind of limit the amount of angle that Webb has to sort of turn and look at things because we don't want it to swing around too far where that heat, like I said, can mess with the instrumentation. We wanna keep those instruments really, really cold so that they're operating properly. All right, so we've done all this, right? This is all in the past. James Webb is, is operating uh, well, as far as we know. And the way we know that is because when we first turned it on, uh, we had to start to calibrate its instrumentations so that it could take nice clear pictures of objects in space for us. So to do this, we pointed the mirrors toward the constellation Ursa Major, 
Um, Ursa Major, we recognize a little bit more handily as being where the Big Dipper lies in the sky. Uh, the Big Dipper is actually like the tail piece of what is known as the Great Bear. And within Ursa Major, there is a star that's very similar to our sun. Uh, that's what James Webb targeted first. Uh, that star's name is HD84406. And when we turned it on, this is what the star looked like. Voila. Uh-oh. <laughs> Wait, this looks like a bunch of smeared stars, right? This doesn't look like a nice, crisp, clean view of a star. So that's OK, right? We kind of expected that that was going to happen. And if you count all of the little uh, you know, spots of light here, you'll find that there are 18 points of light or 18 stars that we see. So there actually aren't 18 stars in this picture. What we're looking at are the 18 different segments of that big honeycomb structure of the mirror. They're just not aligned properly. So essentially we have 18 telescopes operating separately Right, but what we really want is one telescope that has 18 times the power, right? So the NASA scientists had to kind of figure out, okay, which point of light goes with which segment of the mirror. And once they did that, they were then able to kind of reconstruct the honeycomb pattern. And this all uh, enabled the beginning of the process of um, segment alignment. And you'll notice actually something a little strange in this picture is that um, things are kind of inverted or upside down compared to the schematic, right? So if you look at the starlight coming in at the bottom on B1, right? The very bottom of the screen. B1 in the little graphic of the honeycomb of the primary mirror is all the way at the top, right? So you might think, well, hey, this, this looks like it's you know, upside down. But really what's happening is the light is inverted, right? As it comes, it bounces off that primary mirror and then back into the detector. So it's kind of like if you've ever been to the carnival and you've been to the fun house mirror section of the carnival and you see that big curved mirror that flips your image upside down, that's sort of the same idea as what's going on here. All right, once we had all of the images sort of spread and figured out what part of the mirror they were connected to, um, all it took was doing some adjustments. So um, most of the major kind of discrepancies were fixed that might've happened during launch, right? Launch is bumpy. It's not really a, a smooth process. So we try to make it as smooth as possible, but um, there is some turbulence always. And so the mirrors get a little jostled around. They're a little bit off center from where they should be. So this, uh, this allows the scientists to kind of really try to pinpoint um, how the image is coming in at each plate separately. And then once we've done that, we can now start to position uh, all of the different stars that we see into the one image of the star in a process called image stacking. So this is pretty tough to do because basically <laughs> to work together like a single mirror, um, the scientists had to match everything to within a fraction of a wavelength. So something as small as 50 nanometers. Now, that's like if you were to take a meter stick, which is about this big, chop it up into a billion pieces, a billion with a B, and then collect 50 of them, right? That's how small uh, they had to kind of get things calibrated. Uh, to put that into perspective another way, if you imagine that the big primary mirror, the honeycomb, is the United States, then each one of those 18 sections is about the size of Texas. And they had to align those Texas-sized pieces to within an inch and a half of perfection. <laughs> so 
pretty uh pretty impressive and we can see here that their hard work paid off right once they were able to image stack uh, we get this nice picture of the star uh, hd 84406 and the spikes that we see around it are supposed to be there they're what we call diffraction spikes and they kind of remind us right that light behaves like a wave and when it comes in it's bending around uh, objects and sort of canceling the wave out at certain spots. So we sort of see this ripple effect uh, coming out from these central spots. All of this took place in February of this year. And then in March of this year, we pointed James Webb at another star. This one has the very elegant name of two mass J17554052 plus 6551277. I'm not kidding. Um, and this one's located about 2000 light years away from Earth. It's a very pretty star, but I'm actually more interested in the rest of the photo. So what we saw before um, when the telescope wasn't aligned was a whole bunch of smeared patches of light. Um, we sort of see some fuzzy patches of light in this picture as well, but those aren't smeared, you know, inconsistencies, those are galaxies, right? And those galaxies are being detected in the background, probably some billions of light years behind this foreground star. So that's a good sign, right? That means that James Webb is, is working the way that we intended. Okay. So we've kind of caught everybody up to speed. This is where James Webb is at now. And let's now think forward. Let's kind of predict what we're going to use James Webb to look at and what we're going to hope, hopefully learn about our universe uh, when pictures start coming back this summer. So we're zooming out of our solar system, right? We've left Earth. We are going beyond the rest of the planet's uh, orbits here and leaving the gravitational influence of our sun. And our sun is going to just kind of dissolve down into a single point of light, just like all the other stars. And we're going to zoom past the stars that are closest to us in our galaxy. And we're going to keep zooming, zooming, zooming until eventually we're going to zoom out so far that we start to see our Milky Way galaxy. And here she comes. And the Milky Way is a collection of at least 100 billion stars. Some estimates put it all the way at 400 billion stars. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll get a better idea now with James Webb. Taking a look, it's hard to know the exact number of stars of our own galaxy because we're in it, right? So it's hard to measure uh, from within. But galaxies are awesome. They show us how the matter, all the stuff in the universe is organized on very large scales. And so in order to understand the nature and history of our universe, scientists study how the matter is currently organized and how that organization has changed throughout cosmic time. Our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, but galaxies have not always looked like this, right? The ones that we're familiar with were formed over the course of billions of years and by several different processes, including collisions of smaller galaxies. And it's thought that pretty much every major galaxy that we know of today has gone through at least one merger since the universe was 6 billion years old. So these things, even though, you know, billions of years is way longer than we live, they're kind of colliding with each other pretty quickly. At the very center of our Milky Way lies a supermassive black hole, and that's known as Sagittarius A star. During the Webb Telescope's first slate of observations, astronomers are going to use its imaging power to try to understand why Sag Sagittarius A star is the only supermassive black hole 
that's known to produce these flickering flares in the material around it. We don't know why. So that's hopefully one mystery that we'll solve pretty quickly. This is a simulation, right? This isn't a real black hole. Um, and that's because, well, you can't see a black hole. Um, you can see at the very center, there is an object there that's circular, um, but the definition of a black hole is that it's something that is so massive that not even light can escape its surface, right? So there's just no way for us to actually observe it or see it. But what we can see is the event horizon or the last rim of light that is going fast enough that it can escape the black hole. Um, so we can see that. And then surrounded by that is what's known as the black hole's accretion disk. This is a bunch of gas and dust that's getting gobbled up um, by the black hole. And what's cool in the simulation is, is we're kind of showing how the black hole warps the, the view of things behind it. So right now, right, it kind of looks like it's going above and below. Um, but really, the, the accretion disk would be a flat disk. It's just that there's so much gravity there that things behind the black hole get bent up and around it. So it's totally mind-bending stuff. <laughs> we now know that there are extremely large black holes at the center of most galaxies, but we don't know the nature behind the relationship between galaxies and their black holes. So that's one of the big open-ended questions that we hope James Webb is gonna help us answer. And now, as we continue to zoom out even farther, we're going to see lots and lots of points of light. And these points now all represent galaxies, not stars. And looking at each galaxy further and further and further away from us is revealing to us what they looked like billions of years ago. And that's because light travels at a finite speed. Right? It's only got one speed. So if I'm looking at an object that's one light year away from us, then I'm seeing that object as it looked one year ago. Because it takes a year for the light to travel from the surface of that object across space until it reaches my eye. So if I'm looking now at galaxies that are billions of light years away, I'm effectively looking back in time billions of years ago, right? And I'm seeing the universe as it was at a much younger age. So when we do that, we tend to see that the galaxies really far away from us are much smaller than how they are up here now. They're also very clumpy, right? They have uh, lots of star formation occurring in these big massive knots. And another big open-ended question for James Webb is to figure out why. Why do these things, what is the nature of the structure change of galaxies over time? And since James Webb can look really, really far away, further away than any telescope before it, we'll get to see sort of this, the chronology, the timeline of how galaxies change from the early universe to how they are now. All right, one of the most absolutely exciting things for me though, that James Webb is gonna do uh, early on in, in its mission is it's gonna look at exoplanets, okay? So exoplanets are planets that orbit other stars, not our sun. And NASA just recently announced actually that they have now confirmed that there are at least 5,000 exoplanets that we've detected um, in our galaxy. So that's pretty cool. The one we're looking at right now is known as TRAPPIST-1, and it's been confirmed to have not one, not two, but seven exoplanets orbiting its host star. So it's a solar system that's, you know, not too dissimilar from our own. The star at the center is smaller and dimmer than our sun. It's known as a red dwarf type star. And the seven exoplanets, all seven of them, are what we call terrestrial planets. 
So they're a lot closer to Earth and Venus and Mars and Mercury than they are to Jupiter or Saturn, which are gas giant planets. The green space that we see, um, that's not really there. That's a, that's a visualization that we provide in open space, but that's what we call the habitable zone of the, of the star. And so sometimes we call it the habitable zone. Sometimes we refer to it as the Goldilocks zone because that's the region that is just right for where liquid water can exist at the surface of the temperature uh, or of the planet rather. And what's exciting about TRAPPIST-1 is that it has three planets orbiting within that habitable zone. So that's, you know, that's good. That's prospective for us. How do we find these exoplanets? So astronomers will find most of them using what's known as the transit method. And they'll take a different telescope, not James Webb. Um, historically, it was called the Kepler Space Telescope. That one, that mission just ended. Now there's another one called TESS. Um, but what they do is these telescopes just stare at a star for a long period of time. And they measure the brightness of that star um, over you know, some period of time. And if an exoplanet happens to cross in front of the star in its orbit, they'll notice that the brightness dips down a little bit. And then you can say, hey, okay, there must be a planet orbiting that star. When we have multi-planetary exoplanet systems, this transit curve that we see to the bottom left can be a little bit more complicated. Um, so you can see a big dip from the big planet here, and it comes back up. And then we'll see a smaller dip, but then there's a second planet, so it goes down even further. So yeah, you guys get the idea. And I'm showing you this because, not because James Webb is going to do this, right? James Webb probably won't be making new exoplanet discoveries from scratch but it's going to follow up on exoplanets that we already know about. And it's going to primarily be used to try to figure out what the atmospheres of these planets are made of. And so like what the air is like on these planets. So how do we do that? Oh boy, okay. Well, I'm gonna pass out some glasses for everybody. on yeah oh yeah feel free to put them on as Thank soon you, as you get them of course mm -hmm. all right and for those of you at home we have a way to do this over the camera too, which is pretty nifty. <laughs> but the question becomes, what do you see when you put on the glasses and look towards a source of light? <laughs> so you can look maybe at the lights behind us. Yeah, I'm hearing some colors being shouted out. That's awesome. You guys should be able to see some rainbows, right? Yeah, awesome. So that's because these glasses are what we call diffraction gratings or prism glasses. And astronomers use this fact that you can take light, white light, like sunlight or starlight, and you can spread it out into all the different colors of the rainbow. Uh, and that fact helps us learn about the stuff that makes up the universe. So, the way it works is every single atom and every single element and every single molecule has its own unique fingerprints of colors that it absorbs out of the rainbow spectrum. So incoming starlight passes through the atmosphere layer of some exoplanet. 
And some of the colors of the rainbow are gonna get absorbed by the gas that make up that exoplanet's air. And then other colors are gonna be able to pass right through and eventually they'll get picked up by the detectors on the Webb telescope. Right, so some of that gas that makes up the atmosphere is gonna absorb some of the colors out of the rainbow. And then the trick becomes knowing which gas molecules correspond to the missing colors that we see when we observe sort of empty sections of the full rainbow. So for example, if we know that carbon monoxide absorbs red and violet out of the full rainbow, but then when we interpret the light coming back from the exoplanet at James Webb and we still see red and violet, then we can kind of say like, okay, this planet's atmosphere must not be made up of carbon monoxide because if it was, red and violet wouldn't be there. It would get absorbed by the planet. But on the other hand, right, if we know that maybe water vapor absorbs orange and blue and indigo out of the full rainbow spectrum, and then when the light reaches Webb's detectors, we see all of the colors except orange, blue, and indigo, then we can kind of safely assume that water vapor does make up the exoplanet's atmosphere. And why would we wanna look for water vapor or water at an exoplanet? <laughs> well, because where we find water here on earth, we typically find life. And so if James Webb can find water at an exoplanet, then we've got a good spot to start looking more closely and hopefully answer that really amazingly poignant question, right? Are we alone in the universe? So that's everything that I have prepared for today. Um, I can stop, take some questions if there are any, um, and then I'm very happy to jump into open space uh, with the remainder of any time that we have to just fly around and show you guys more stuff about, about the universe. How are things in the chat, Crystal? Is anything? Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, let's see. I can load this up. Yeah. Sure. Yes. So yeah, you're you're more than welcome to to download it, and it was NASA grant funded. Uh, project by the museum and its partners in Sweden um, to yeah build something that we can use as the base for our space shows that we make. Is this um, similar to the like Microsoft's worldwide telescope thing? It's it's so funny that you yeah it's so funny that you said that. I just saw on the Facebook page of the director of the space shows um, that they are actually officially partnering with Worldwide Telescope. Um, to further this, this project. So yeah, so it's similar. It's a little bit different in the sense that this program is feeding in um, data from NASA missions. Exactly, yep. And also like the natural imagery data. Like, yep, so things like uh, images from the high rise camera on Mars get stitched into our Mars. So what we're looking at is really the real yeah, well, stuff. The data, right? Exactly. So yeah, so let's see. And the public as well, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So we can do that actually. We can go to Mars. The higher camera is probably. It's awesome. <laughs> so if we go to Mars, First thing we'll see is just kind of like our base layer here. 
But if I turn on, on my color layers, something called high rise, high rise local set, we'll see all these like little patches appear on the surface of Mars. And those are places where we have the high resolution imagery. So if I you know, zoom down to any of those spots, it's gonna get blurry surrounding them. And this is feeding in info from the internet. So there is a little bit of kind of pop in here, but we should be able to. Get really close and then pitch our camera up. And this is what it would be like to land on the surface of Mars. This is really what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, so it really gives you the sense that you're there, <laughs> which is cool. And then if we get bored of being over here, then you know we can go see what else captures our eye. We're kind of like on one of Mars's volcanoes. And Mars is known to have the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. Over here. Yeah, and eventually, you know, the whole planet will be filled in with high, ri high rise and high resolution image data. Um, and we'll get more data from the rovers that have landed there. So Perseverance, the, the newest one um, that touched down, I think it was last year, right? So lots of exciting stuff coming which is pretty cool. The rectangular shapes, yeah. So these are basically pictures that are taken from the camera that's on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So there is a spacecraft that's orbiting around Mars. And this high-rise camera can zoom in really close to the surface, take some pictures, and then kind of download them, right, and transmit them over to Earth for us. And so we're seeing those patches of pictures uh, because, you know, the camera is going to have to do a lot of loops all around the planet before it's going to be able to capture everything at that high resolution. So that's why they're in sort of like these, these patchy uh, bits. That's just for the super high res stuff. I can um, get kind of a little lower resolution uh, with, yeah, this guy. So the CTX data is kind of like, it's kind of like a little bit middle ground where it's not as high resolution as the high rise data, but it's still better than, you know, the, the totally zoomed out image that we're kind of used to seeing of Mars. So here's a patch that's high rise and then surrounding it is CTX. So that's kind of like, middle range resolution, but still looks pretty good.
So that's a great question. We we kind of do, um, but we don't have that loaded into open space just yet. So um, we have a spacecraft called the Parker Solar Probe that is um, the, the closest object that we've gotten to the sun. Um, it's got like this completely insane sun shield that blows even webs out of the water, right? Because this thing is getting really, really close um, to take high resolution pictures of, of sun data. And um, I can probably actually find the picture of it. Yeah. Yeah, so. So let me see if I can find this. Yeah, SDO is, is still awesome. It takes um, photos in a lot of different wavelengths of light so that we can see kind of almost through the outermost layer of the sun and look for things like sunspots and um, you know where we expect solar flares might, might happen. Um, this one, the Parker Solar Probe, let me see, this was really, um, there we go. This is the highest resolution image of the sun that we've seen so far. <laughs> That's insane, right? <laughs> it kind of looks like, I don't know, like popcorn to me for some reason, right? It's like got that convective nature. Yeah, it kind of looks like glass a little bit. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, unfortunately that stuff isn't in open space. Um, the best thing that I can do with the sun, let me see if I can get this going really quick. So what's cool is open space has you know, a lot of users now at this point, and there are people that are making like cool extra little modules. So as long as I have it open, I can just like import this thing here that somebody named Alex made, and that will load into my open space. And then I'm gonna go take a look at the sun. And I'm going to, turn off the glare, but turn on the star. And I should be able to do, let's see, let's see. At the start of sequence. Yeah, so now we're able to see some magnetic field lines of the sun. And then I can speed up time a little bit. So this is, um, this is a module that's capturing data from uh, July of the year 2000, when a big solar flare event known as the Bastille Day event um, took place on the surface of our sun. And if I speed up time a little bit here, you should be able to see that solar flare happen. I don't want to go too fast because then it's just going <laughs> to, there we go. <laughs> so Luckily, Earth was not in the crossfire of that. Um, uh, yeah. So a lot of really amazing stuff happening, uh, you know, in astronomy research that um, we're taking advantage of at the museum. And uh, yeah, I hope that you guys, you know, feel um, encouraged to download and, and mess around with this stuff yourself because it's available. So 
That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure.